order issued by a federal judge expire today and officials estimate there are still about 400 homeless people living in tents like this along the river trail. At one point, that population soared to more than a thousand. This homeless encampment stretches three miles down to the five freeway near Angel Stadium. Homeless advocates took the issue to federal court over the county's plans to evict, arguing there isn't enough room in shelters. As part of the agreement in federal court to allow the cleanup to continue today, the county is offering 30-day motel vouchers and other services, including transportation. What happens at the end of 30 days? That's something to think about. Well, what do you think will happen? There'll be a lot of people on the streets, on bus benches and parks. The county is also expected to add seven to 800 more beds for temporary housing. Hundreds gathered their things and got ready to leave today. Well, we're here today to um, sign up for the list and see where they're going to take us. Some people said Motel 6, some people said Kean. We don't know exactly. This comes as L.A. County is struggling to house its homeless population. A report by the L.A. Homeless Services Authority shows the homeless population is growing much faster than the supply of new housing. Despite two measures passed by voters in 2016 and 2017, providing hundreds of millions of dollars for homeless services. Sheriff's officials started the cleanup here along the river trail at Taft and Ball. They're not sure exactly how long it's going to take, but they say that the river trail should return to normal. Hello, I'm Fletcher Jones, Jr. is peaking, especially in West Coast cities where politicians are generally tolerant of the problem and businesses are seeing more aggressive conflicts with the homeless all the time. Take Portland, Oregon, for example, where they have seen a 31 percent jump in the number of homeless in just the last year. Uh, businesses are seeing employees threatened and customers driven away. The CEO for Columbia Sportswear says he will decide soon whether to move the company's Sorrell brand headquarters and their 50 employees out of downtown Portland and back to the suburbs. This jewelry shop owner is definitely moving out. It's the constant defecating at the front door, throwing up at the front door, peeing all over. We get spit running down the windows in the doorway. It, it's, just, it's just really difficult. And they are seeing the same problems in Seattle. In fact, we talked to a business owner whose company has been here 70 years. They're now fed up and they're moving out, Bill. Well, what are the city leaders saying about this, Dan? Well, the mayors, the city council members, they all know they got a major problem, but their answers seem to always come back to raising taxes and spending more on social pro programs. In general, they have tolerated things like derelict RVs and illegal camps, parking and, and sleeping in doorways. Portland's mayor says what he won't do is criminalize homelessness. Advocates for the homeless like that approach, but the problem is only getting worse, and now they're worried about the businesses leaving instead of paying more and being part of the solution. We have not, as a country, gotten a handle on homelessness and the poverty that drives that homelessness. And until we do, we're going to have friction. Homelessness is not pretty. It's not elegant. A, a big complaint I hear from business owners all the time is that the city leaders seem to care more about the homeless than about uh, the businesses being able to stay here. Bill? Uh, Dan Springer, thank you. On the streets of Seattle today. Thanks, Dan.
own. If they don't respond within those 15 days, the city will go in and clear the property for those property owners, and we will send them a bill for the cleanup. So um, again, going back to the rules, we have to go through those steps. We have to give that amount of notice. Um, so we will see cleanups going to more of a monthly basis to make sure we're staying in line with those laws, again, that could potentially lead to, to lawsuit. I mentioned our homeless task force. As you can see, there's a variety of things we're working on. I won't go into each of these, but again, we've been working since May. We've made a lot of progress, and I'll go through some of those accomplishments so far. One of the things we did is we set up an alert L, an, um, option on our Alert LE app. This is a mobile app that anybody can access on Android or an iPhone mobile device. Um, I guess it should be, say, Apple mobile device. Um, I really encourage everybody in this room that you, your staff, um, tell your neighbors, tell anybody in our community to download this app. This is a place where you can go report anything to our code enforcement public works team, um, city staff regarding issues from potholes to street lights, et cetera. Um, but also we have homeless issues on here. And you can report panhandling. You can report trespassing. Now, understanding that this isn't something we're going to respond to right away. Someone's not monitoring it and running out as soon as we get a report. But it's critical for us to know what's occurring in our community. And we do review it. And code enforcement will determine um, cleanups or patrols based on the data they're re receiving from this. So it's very critical for our community to use this tool to report things. I think all of us um, that are on Facebook have noticed quite a few community groups have started, and people love to report everything in these community groups, which is all great and dandy, except I guarantee you no one from the city is reading those on a regular basis and able to keep up with everything that's happening on those groups. There's like 13 or 14 of them now. And so we need to encourage folks to report things in the right way so we can actually get the information and come up with ideas on how to address it. Um, these are some of the statistics that we've had since we launched this um, in June, um, very end of June we launched this, so again coming up to a year here, about 512 reports have been entered and we see this number increasing which means our community is letting us know and you can see the hot spots that I mentioned earlier and again this was used in determining um, the mailing for today's events and the businesses we reached out to. Um, Robert Glasser will be presenting after me. He is a new community services deputy that the city brought in this year, um, the start of the year just about, and um, he's an amazing asset for our community, um, something a little different than maybe all of the cities out here are doing, and Robert's really the liaison for all of you, and he's somebody that can come out to your business and make sure you have what you need to be armed to protect yourself, and he'll be sharing with everybody some really great tips on how to protect your business in just a moment here. Um, and I'll let him do more about his role. Um, we do have uh, several resources we're using to help those in need. We have a helpline, we have a request form, the resource cards are in the back. And I just want to emphasize here, um, in the city of Lake Elsinore, we're basically saying um, you can get help or we're going to help you move on because we're not going to keep allowing you to have illegal behavior in our community. So we try to tell the homeless individuals, you know, we're here to help you. We're really trying to help. Um, I'll say legitimately now have a team that can help um, if they want it. But if they don't want that help, or if we've offered help on multiple occasions, Robert's going to cite them, and then we're going to cite them again, and then we're going to arrest them, and we're going to keep putting the pressure on them to make them recognize that they can't behave this way in our community. And um, so again, we encourage you, if you do see them, we tell people all the time, let the homeless individuals know that these resources do exist for them when they get to the point where they feel that they need the help. Another thing that we're doing is we're working regionally with Temecula, Marietta, Will Damar, um, Canyon Lake, and Menifee. And we've been working together for three years now talking about homelessness and trying to understand how we can be consistent throughout the region and also to come together and encourage some change, much needed change um, at the county level, state, federal levels to assist us in really being able to help the homeless. 
And one of the things we are pushing throughout the Valley and really starting to roll out is this idea of responsible compassion. And this is really driven by the idea of getting our whole community behind us in saying, let's help those that are homeless, let's help those that are in need, but let's help them in the right ways. Let's not give them a hand out, let's give them a hand up. And the idea being that when you give somebody money, if you are, see a panhandler in a center, and I'm sure some of you that are in the business community have seen this, where I was in Temecula the other day, and I literally in three minutes saw this gentleman in the median right across from the mall, and I, I think three people gave him money in just the time I was at that stop signal. And while I know these individuals have a lot of compassion, and we all do, and there's a lot of folks that um, really are compelled to give, by giving that dollar or two or three, that person is going to come back tomorrow or the next day or the next week. Because I guarantee you, if that person was not getting any money, they wouldn't come back. It would not be coming back. And so we really want to encourage our community, um, our businesses, our faith based try not to give to them in that way. Give to them in the right ways. And so we have this Facebook page that we're starting to try and get some traction on where for the region, you can go and post if you have something, if you have something you want to give, if you have a job you would like to offer or support in some way, you can post that. Our community can go there and find ways to actually help in the right ways um, and generate some conversations about how can I help, what do I have, and share those resources. Um, for our business community, we're working on several things. We've been working with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've done uh, several presentations for their groups as well. And um, our business community is critical because they also can serve as a resource for us, for our homeless individuals. So it goes beyond just the enforcement side and the impacts of the business, but also what support can you bring in helping our efforts. And the city will be um, rolling out a toolkit of a variety of um, resources for all of you, including some panhandling um, posters that we'd love for you to place in your businesses to help encourage people not to give in the wrong ways, to give in the right ways. Um, uh, some checklists to assist you in being safer, other resources, and then of course some presentations like this. We do have a website where you can go, it's called Bu um, Business Crime Prevention. It already has lots of tips on there and information for our business community to assist you in protecting your business. And then most of you do have some of these signs already, but we will be working on new sign signage with the Chamber of Commerce that folks can get um, if they need to replace it or would like some for their business. So there's some forms up on the table over there. I think we still have some left. There's some options here you can check about ways you want to be engaged with us, and that will help us make sure we notify you about some of these things. Some other successes, I'll just really mention we have an outreach team. We're working with a group called Social Work Action Group. They're in the audience with us today, and they're really the team going out every single week, talking to homeless individuals, getting to know them by name, asking them how we can help them, encouraging them to get off of the street, and trying to make a real difference in their lives, and going back to giving in the right ways. They have a website, and they have several ways on there you can help. And so I, I like to encourage our community to go there um, if they really, really want to try to make a difference. The other thing I'll point in out here is the, count, the city does participate in the county's point in time count. They do this every year. It's a baseline um, comparison data about how many homeless individuals are in each city of Riverside County. Um, it's supposed to be wrong, I guess, is what they tell me. <laughs> but it's not a, a full picture of our homeless, it's just to show a year-to-year -year comparison. This year, our number for the city preliminarily was uh, 78 homeless. Um, last year, it was 65, I believe. And so we know that number is probably more likely two times that, about 150 or so here in Lake Elsinore. Um, but again, this is just a point in time. And also, we have to remember that the boundaries of our city are very blurred. So when you're in Lakeland Village, that's county. The city is restricted in what we can do over there. That's not our jurisdiction. Lakeland Village, there's areas um, all around us that are county, technically. And the city can only do so much in regards to those areas. But that goes back to our reason why we're working regionally to try to address things. So what can our business community do to assist us? And I won't go too much into one and two, but really it's important to understand how critical it is for you to find ways to secure and protect your property, to make that investment in making your property secure. 
Um, one thing that the police department does offer is a free, crime-free business program, completely free. They come out and train your staff, they come out and um, inspect your property, and they'll offer you suggestions on how to improve the safety of your property. And we have flyers in the back. Also, I'll mention the property appearance and maintenance. Um, this is kind of like the broken window theory, et cetera, where, you know, the, what's your appearance of, on the outside of your business? How do your medians look? How does your parking lot look? Do you have trash throughout it? Um, has it been painted recently? Um, are the windows covered up in posters? Um, the appearance is what attracts. You know, what your appearance gives off, the image you give, is the type of attention you attract. And so you'll notice that some centers that are maybe a little bit more run down are usually more impacted by the homeless. They feel more comfortable there. They feel more welcomed there. So it's very important that we think about that as well. We talked about responsible compassion and homeless to hire. This would be great if we had some of our business community um, step forward and say, hey, we, we have a position. We'd be willing to hire somebody that's homeless that's struggling to stay off of the street or facing homelessness because they don't have a job or they can't pay their rent. And we'll share more about this later today from a, a local company that is doing this and has had success. Um, this can even just be job training. Anything helps. Um, Support established organizations, time, talent, treasures, again, um, these nonprofits that are really making a difference and trying to help our communities. Spread the message, help us tell our story, help us explain to other businesses what they can do to help. You all have neighbors, I'm sure you have connections, or maybe you're representing multiple businesses today, but please help us spread this information to everybody. Um, this presentation today, our meeting is being streamed on Facebook and it, it will be recorded and published later, so you can share it with others as well. And then it's critical, as I mentioned, to report things. Please, don't hesitate. Call myself, call Robert, call 911 if it's an emergency, report it on Alert Ali, let us know. We wanna hear from you. We want to try to address it. So after this, um, this meeting, there's several other things occurring within our community. Um, as I mentioned, this all will be posted online, and I've already posted our PowerPoints um, from Robert and I on, on our website, at Homeless Task Force website, and so you can go there and get it. But you can see some things we're working on, and, and I just want to emphasize again, we really are looking at this big picture. We're looking at every element of the issues facing homelessness. This includes housing opportunities. This includes working with our faith-based organizations, trying to inform and educate our residents, and then all of you. So this is one piece of so many, and I don't want to take too much time because I always run long, as always. And so um, I'm going to bring up Robert, and then we can take some questions. Um, after Robert's presentation regarding some things you can do to protect your property, we do have a few um, security companies, private security companies here, that are just going to share strategies and ideas with all of you for ways that we can in increase security and protection of our properties and allow you to ask them questions because there's some more innovative ways for us to maybe help cover our whole city. It's unrealistic and unlikely that our police department's ever gonna have enough resources to be traveling through every business center all day, night, random times to protect these businesses. We need to do it together, and I like to say if we're aggressive now, if we make a difference now, if we invest now, maybe we won't look like OC and LA. If we wait and we don't, later it's much harder. But if we start now and we really come up with solutions and work together and put our efforts, our time and our money to making a difference, we can stop that from happening. If we don't, this problem's continuing to rise. It's above and beyond anything that the city itself can do. We will fight and we will partner, but um, this is a national problem and it's growing. And the lack of housing is very real. And the ability for these folks to actually get off the streets and go somewhere is very low. People are on a list for two years. Two years to get county vouchers to get a house. This list is a thousand people long for Riverside County or whatever it is, several hundred. And you have people for two years on that list. So um, I, just, I just say that to help everybody recognize that someone said in one of our community meetings basically that, you know, people don't want housing for the homeless, right? And definitely in the city of Lake Elsinore, believe me, we do not want a shelter. We would never be supportive of a shelter. They have proven to not work and to only attract homeless individuals. We see that in Riverside. 
We see that all across the country. But if they don't have a house or they don't have a place to go, where are they going to be? They are going to be behind your business. They are going to be in the vacant fields. They are going to be everywhere we see them now. We can't magically make them disappear. We have to help them. And there are ways to do this. And there's a process called Housing First. And again, with the lack of time, I don't want to go into it too much, but we'll have questions at the end of the discussion. But I just want to share that with everybody as a, as a place to start thinking. Um, because the city is open to innovative and different and real solutions to address that. We've been talking to landlords about possibilities. I know one's here, Scott. You know, what can we do to work together to create opportunities to house these individuals? When I have a homeless person come to me and say, I want off the street. We had a gentleman at our council meeting yesterday, or Tuesday, 65 years old, severely disabled, brave enough to come forward to the mic, which I was intrigued by. <clears throat> and he had nowhere to go. Severely disabled, 65 years old, has no idea what to do. What do we do? What do we do with this individual? Where do they go? So I just, I just encourage everybody to think through that because how do we get them from behind your buildings? How do we get them out of these vacant lots? Where can we send them? And the city is willing and able to try and push a little bit on the county side. What can we change? What needs to happen to make it easier to house these individuals, to get more housing opportunities available and full support so these people need a lot of support to get out of their situations. I'll say I went out for the point in time count and most of them had several years on the street, several, several years. This isn't 60 days, two months. This is several years, from three years to 19 years. I met a gentleman, 19 years homeless. And if you ask them, what's the issue? Why are you homeless? What do you, what do you need to get out of homelessness? They can't even answer the question because they've been out of society for so long that they don't even really know what they need. They don't even know how to begin. They don't know if it is not just a job. They need a place to live. And they've been on the street so long that they've turned alcohol or drugs, or maybe they started out on alcohol or drugs. There's a variety, right? But a lot of them have turned to alcohol or drugs just to survive on the street, just to sleep in the cold to sustain sleeping on the ground. So now they have alcohol, drug issues, they have mental health issues from living in this environment for so many years and not having, uh, being in real society. So now they have mental health issues, they have no job, they have no house, they have no money, and they've broken all of the trust of probably their family members. And so these are their situations. And so it's really critical to understand what we're facing as a community in addressing homelessness and one of the reasons why we're seeing the same things that we're seeing across the country, across the country. So with that, I'll turn it over to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Can everyone hear me? Because I don't like being stationary. I like to walk around. And, you can use um, the mic if you now want. Now I'm going to use this. But we are recording. That's fine. I'll talk loud. Use the mic. I'll use my big voice. Uh, right yeah, I want to say. I'll do my best to stay stationary since we are recording. Good afternoon, good morning. My name is Robert Glasser. I'm the Community Services Deputy for the City of Lake Elsinore. Obviously, you're all here because you have a vested interest in this community, be it a, a property owner, a business owner, uh, someone who lives here. So thank you for taking the time out to come out and listen to us and, and hopefully be able to take something away from this that's uh, going to be beneficial to you, your tenants, your, your customers, your business. Uh, here's my information. I'll leave it up there for a minute to... Uh, you guys can write down if you want to get a hold of me or have questions uh, that you don't want to ask in an open forum. Just a little bit about myself. I've been with the Sheriff's Department uh, 10 years. I've been assigned to Lake Elsinore Station for the last five. Uh, I've worked various assignments here, uh, day shift, night shift, swing shift. I've worked the county. I've worked the city of Wildemar. And most recently, like Nicole said, in January, I took over the position as community services deputy uh, here in the city. Um, I've learned a lot in the last four months in regards to what we can and cannot do with the homeless. Um, I'm not going to go into the legalities of that. That's not why you're here. But understand that we don't want to end up like Santa Ana, Oceanside, Los Angeles. We don't want the lawsuits and we don't want that uh, stigma of being a place that the homeless can be harbored and, and, and stay safe. It's not that we don't want to help those people but we don't want to drive businesses out. I, I know Nicole showed that video of Portland, Oregon. Let's raise taxes, let's add more, more money to business owners, 
to help these funds. Well, if you don't have business owners or landowners there, then raising taxes all you want isn't going to be the problem. It's not about driving money or raising money because Los Angeles raised $270 million last year and still have 35,000 homeless people living on the streets. Uh, what's the draw? Well, criminals are known to gravitate towards easy targets. So they look for the open doors, the open windows, ladders to access points, unlocked vehicles. They see items like purses, walls, electronics that are in plain view, uh, poorly lit areas. Um, drive down Main Street, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, the vestibule's there, not lit. I see them when I was working swing, when I was working graveyards, I'd stop and move those people along. Um, Shrubbery block and view. Uh, one of the things that happens is they'll look for the low windows and they'll, they'll break into your business through a low window and it's blocked by the shrubbery. So we gotta make sure that we're taking every advantage out of the, the criminal's hands and putting it in your hands. So people call us all the time for trespass orders, okay? There's someone sleeping in a, in a field, there's someone behind the jack in the box, there's someone behind the business, there's someone sitting in front of the Circle K. Well, in order to actually enforce a trespass, you have to have a couple things. You must show a pattern, and this is coming from our deputy district attorney who does all our filings. Must show a pattern. Can't just be one time. I can't just go up to the person, hey, you can't be here, here's your citation, you're going to jail. No, he has to violate multiple times. Must document. You must document who they are, show that the build that pattern, and we must give them an opportunity to leave. But most importantly, we must have a victim. So if, you have a, if you, you're sitting there at Circle K and there's someone panhandling, we can cite them on the panhandling. We can't cite them on the trespass unless the property owner, number one, says I want them arrested and signs a private person's arrest form, or number two, we have what's called a valid 602 letter, a trespass letter on file at the police station. I brought some blank ones up here for if you have a property and you'd like to have one signed, please do, I'll take them. We'll get it filed, they're good for one year. But I need to have a victim. I need to have someone there to say, yes, this person is violating uh, the 602, the trespass, and I want them arrested. What that letter does is that allows you to not have to get involved. That basically gives me the ability to make that arrest without you having to sign a private person's arrest form and place that person under arrest. So everyone probably knows that they have seen the movie, you know, movies where they say, oh, I'm placing you under citizen's arrest. The way the law is written, that if you are going to place someone or want charges pressed against someone and it's a misdemeanor crime, such as a trespass, you are the one that has to accompany me to that suspect, and you have to tell them why you are placing them under arrest. A lot of people don't want to do that. It's scary. This person, what's the retaliation? So having this trespass letter in, in force now, you don't have to do that. That allows your customers, or excuse me, your employees to do that as well. So we need to have this, these issues reported. If the issues aren't reported, we're not aware. Now, Nicole brought up the Facebook pages. I think there's tons. There's, uh, you know, Canyon Hills talk. There's Temecula talk, Marietta talk, Wildemar talk, uh, What's Up Lake Elsinore, Elevate Lake Elsinore. We don't, as a police, we don't monitor those, those pages. We might see something if, we're, if someone tags myself or my captain or the station in one of those uh, posts, but we're not monitoring it. And that's not an efficient way to address or report a crime. If a crime has been committed or there is something going on, you need to call our emergency number of 911 or call our non-emergency line and report it. Same with the alert LE. Now, when something comes to alert LE, I get a copy of it and we can address it. But if it's something, again, that requires immediate assistance, I need you guys to call and let us know through our police dispatch. One of the other things you need to have, you must have a desire to prosecute, okay? I understand they're homeless and our hearts go out to some of these people. It's human nature to wanna to care and bring up someone. But again, what is it doing to your business? What is it doing to your property? What is it doing to your customers? And that's only a question you guys can answer. I'm gonna do my part within the legality of the state law to enforce it, but I can't enforce things that I don't have a victim. So one of the things you wanna to do too is you wanna to train your staff. All right, we get a lot of times, 
staff doesn't want to make a make a report because they're not sure if they're allowed to. If they're a key holder, they should be allowed to. They should be allowed to call the police if there's an issue. That comes on training amongst yourselves, amongst your, your, your employees. So let's talk about what can you do. Well, this is your investment. I can't tell you, the city can't tell you how to spend your money, all right? And what I'm gonna present right now is only gonna be tips. It may not be applicable to your business, it may not be applicable to your property. They're just tips that I have seen over the last 10 years to help you guys combat this problem and not just homeless, but anybody who's looking to commit a crime against your, your business, your, your residence, your company, all right? So you gotta weigh your costs. Is it cheaper to continue to do the repairs? I don't know. That's something that you guys have to answer. Is the initial investment in some of these things gonna be less expensive over time? More than likely, yes. All right. And what is the loss that you're losing on your lack of tenants, your lack of customers, your lack of renters, if you're, if you're a, a landlord at an apartment complex or houses, all right? And some of these things you can do if you're in a strip mall, um, you can partner up with some of your customers, or your, excuse me, your, your other neighbors in there. Partner up with them. Let's see if you guys can share some of the costs. And maybe that's having a security patrol come through. Maybe that's putting in some new lighting. You know, you got to talk to your neighbors. You got to know who they are. And again, you have to invest in your own investment. It's your livelihood. So one of the things that's big right now is called SEPTED. It's crime prevention through environmental design. And it's not always applicable in existing buildings because they're built 30, 40 years ago, sometimes 60 years ago, all right? But if you're looking at expanding or into a new construction area, or you're gonna buy a piece of property and build something, this is something you should look into. And to simply put, SEPTED is a proactive design philosophy built around a core set of principles that is based on the belief that the proper design and the effective use of the built environment can lead to a reduction in the fear and incidence of a crime as well as an improvement in the quality of life. Now, who wants a better quality of life? I, I know I do. You know, I think everyone here, that's why we're all here. Okay? And what's the quality of life? Is it more customers coming in, spending money with your business? Is it you know, the ability to spend less time dealing with repair issues? It's gonna be different for everyone. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do right now to deter and prevent the homeless from coming into your property. Well, lighting. Adequate lighting is important. Why is it important? Well, it allows you to see who's coming and going, allows your customers to see who's coming and going, allows your employees to see who's coming and going, it allows me to see who's hanging out in front of your business at 2.30 in the morning, all right? Doesn't give someone a place to hide. Criminals, much like police officers, like to cover darkness. We can, we're kind of like Batman, you know, we can move around real easy, all right? But it allows others to see who's loitering, all right? If you have a security patrol, if you have a security company comes through, that bright light shows that someone's there. It shows a shadow. It shows that there's illegal activity happening, all right? It's expensive, but Edison could pay the cost of your upgrade right now. There's grants that are available through Edison right now that they'll pay the cost to upgrade your lighting. Did anybody know that? No. It was on there, we did the research and it's good through 2020, all right? You just have to go to this link and sign up. Um, it could also reduce your overall cost. If you're a landlord and you're paying for the lighting of the parking lot, well, why not have some energy efficient lighting? And you know what? You're doing your part for the environment as well. Trash cans. Who, who's walked out and just seen the, the mess in the trash cans? I know I have, all right? Well, one of the things you can do is you can secure your trash area, make sure the enclosure is locked. It's out of the area, they can hide in there. If they can't get in, they can't hide. All right? CRNR has a one time fee of 5601 to have the trash cans, get the locking trash cans. Is it a slight inconvenience when you have your hands full? It is, but what's more of an inconvenience? Cleaning up the trash that's left behind? Again, that's a question you guys have to answer yourself. Okay, one of the things you don't want to do is leave items for, out for the transients to rummage through. They look for stuff that's left and discarded. That's why you see so much trash left around in these campgrounds in the, or camp, campsites, these encampments. Because all they're doing is hoarding the stuff that someone else throws away. Someone else's trash is someone else's treasure. Well, 
we all know it's just trash, right? And the city has spent a lot of money. I know Fred and Tim have spent a lot of time out in the, in the lake bottom, behind businesses, cleaning up stuff that has been normally discarded, and these people think it's their prized possession. Clean your trash area regularly. Again, it goes back to don't leave things out for them to rummage through. It's just, it, it's one more thing that you can do to protect yourself. Let's talk about landscaping a little bit. So if you have a big open common area where you have sprinklers, have them come on at alternating times. I know the uh, sprinkler system, who, who's ever tried to program one of those things? Am I, or am I just the idiot that can't figure it out? I gotta have my seven year old, I'm like, hey, figure this out for me. Um, but once you get it figured out, you can have those alternating schedules. You want to change that up. You don't want to give them a place to live you, or sleep. You want those sprinklers to come on so that, well, they're in a nice slumber dreaming of the next trash can they're going to rummage through. It hits them with water. They, they're not going to want to stay there. Okay, keep bushes low. We talked about that earlier. You want to have those bushes low so they can't store items. They can't store their bike. They can't store their trash, their tent, or anything along those lines. Or if you have a low-hanging window, you don't want them to be able to break that window, crawl through, and go through your property. Drought-resistant landscaping. Uh, well, let's talk about you know, the um, decomposed granite, rocks. It's not a comfortable sleeping surface. So go that route if that's the case. <coughs> and eliminate your flat benches. If you have a, an area where there's flat benches, well, they're going to sleep on it. Some people call it inhumane, but you're protecting your business. Have the bench, invest in the bench that will come out. They have the bars that go through. It doesn't give them an opportunity to sleep somewhere. They're very simple things. Let's talk about the exterior of your buildings. Remove ladders. Remove anything that's going to allow them an access to your building. Maybe there's a higher window. Maybe there's access to your roof. Um, Main Street Kitchen and Tap. Found a guy sleeping on their, on their roof. The new uh, Tuscany Grill in Wildemar with the old decanters had people sleeping on their roofs all because the access point was unlocked. I didn't know they were sleeping up there. I don't go up on their roofs. We didn't know, no one knew until they went to fix the air conditioner up there and they found it. They found the encampment. Come and go at night, cover of darkness. So now what they've done is they've installed cameras, they've installed lighting all along that backside of Tuscany and that uh, shopping center to ensure that that doesn't happen again. They've also locked it and they're gonna be in the process of actually removing the ladder from the back side of that building. So if you need to get on the roof, you need to have an extension ladder. Uh, lock up all doors when closing. I can't tell you how many times I've gone in, in my tenure as a police officer, gone to a business because the door didn't close right. Your employee just let it or they didn't turn the, the switch so that they, it would lock on the way, way out. That gives them access. One of the things that seems kind of funny is you remove, the lock, remove lock all tools, mops, water sources, and electrical sources. I know we have Esteban from Lowe's here, but one of the things that would happen is Lowe's had electrical outlets on the back side of the building, and you had transients plugging in their phone, plugging in their phone, plugging in their chargers, their radios. That's all been gone. That's all gone now. They've removed it. And so removing those abilities for them to have a place to harbor or stay helps your business as well. Again, we're going back to lighting. Well-lit entrances and exits in times of darkness. It's gotta be done, you know? Light up your building. If you're gonna be able to get a rebate from Edison, with these energy efficient lighting, even running them 24 hours a day may keep it less expensive than it is now. And again, what's your cost? Is it repair, maybe the door got punched, maybe someone urinated, vomited, defecated, maybe someone vandalized because we can't see them doing it. So let's talk a little about alarm and security. <coughs> alarm systems should be in good working order. Don't put, you know, secured by ADT, secured by Vivint, whatever you're secure. You know, just say alarm in use. Okay? Have a responder available. That is key. We go out to alarm calls all the time and no responder is available. No one's coming out. Well, how am I supposed to let you know that your business was just broken into or someone smashed your window? Who's supposed to be here? He's telling me he's an employee. There's no forced entry. Is he an employee? I don't know. If your business is broken into and there's no responder, 
I'm sorry, the police can't just sit there and wait for, you, wait for 10 o'clock in the morning for when you guys open or show up. You have to have that, those systems in place. You have to have someone who can respond and make a decision. Um, train all staff with codes. We get those as well. They go in, someone new, they're not trained properly. They walk in, they set the alarm. We go, we detain them. Now your brand new employee is sitting in the back of my police car in handcuffs or they're sitting on the curb in handcuffs until we're trying to figure out who they are. Do they really have, have a right to be there? If they don't know the codes, if they don't know the security password, then it's, it makes it difficult for you, it makes it difficult for us. How does it make it difficult for you? Now, your opening just got delayed 45 minutes or whatever the case may be. Cameras, invest in a good camera system. Dummy cameras, everyone knows, can tell a dummy camera now. No, if you don't think that the homeless, the transients, the, the, the criminals don't research what's out there, they do. Guess what, they all have this. Every one of them has this. So they know which is a real camera, which is not. Okay? You wanna train your managers, your key holders, to be able to give us that, that footage. If 10 o'clock in the morning we come in, or you come in and you find that you're, you're place has been broken into or something happened, vandalizing you have a camera system, but you're on vacation and you're the only one who has that access, well, if we can't review that footage, we're not going to know who was there. One of the biggest things in, in, in solving crimes is that immediate crime broadcast. Getting that information out to my patrol deputies as quickly as possible. It's not what you see on TV, we don't have the quick DNA where you know, some guy with sunglasses comes in and gives some camping one line. Things take time, but the more information we get out in the beginning, helps us solve a crime, helps us figure out who committed the crime against you guys, who victimized you. Save all the video of the incidents, okay? It's human nature, we screw up. I, I, I'm guilty of breaking a CD of a, of a, a shoplift because I tossed it in my bag, I went off to the next call, and before I got the booking and the evidence, I cracked it. It's ruined. Now, it's hard to go back and say, hey, I broke the CD you gave me. Oh my gosh, you deleted it off your system? No, save that. <coughs> Cloud storage is cheap. If you're a Google Prime member, you can store video, unlimited video, forever. So just think about those things. Those are things that you should have, because they are readily accessible for us because things do get lost. Things may not transfer over. We had a incident at the outlet center where there was a fight and the security director over there, oh yeah, I, I recorded it, here's the CD. Well, he recorded the wrong camera and everything else was not there. So we lost that ability to show the fight from that point of view, from an unbiased point of view. Things happen. So let's talk about your property in general. You gotta walk your property. If you have a bigger property in an industrial zone, walk your property. Know who's there, look for the trash. We see it, you see it at the homeless encampments. Look for tents, look for personal items. When you walk around the perimeter of your property, you find someone's ID, call us, we'll come and pick it up. Maybe it's an employee who dropped it, maybe it's a credit card, maybe it's your credit card. Maybe someone went through your car, you don't know. Vacant buildings should not look vacant. That's important because when you have a property that looks run down, as Nicole said, they're gonna be gravitated to it because they're comfortable there. Obviously, someone doesn't care about this property. Why? They're not here, look at this place. Well, if you do have some tenants in there and they're able to get into a suite that's vacant, well, they'll break through the walls to get into the, vacant, the suite that's not vacant and then steal. Your property should not look vacant, even if it is. Regular inspections, all right? Maintain the landscape and cleanliness of the building. It, it's, your, it's, it's your community. Turn off or limit all your utilities. So have your electrician come in and pull the fuses or pull the breakers for the electrical outlets inside. Put a lock on the water, put a lock on the gas. Take away the opportunity for them to come in and use your property or damage your property. Know your tenants. Know your neighbors. Get to know who they are. They're a second set of eyes. Walk over to them, introduce yourself. 
if you're a landlord and everything's done via computer or everything's done through a property management company, get your property management company involved. Get out there and know who's there. Know who's actually in there. We all make judgments within the first five minutes of meeting someone. You're going to walk in there, and if this person doesn't seem on the up and up, still your property. You have that choice whether to rent to them or not. But you got to know who's there. You got to know who's there. You got to know who's is there criminal activity? Are they bringing in criminal activity? That's up to you. You got to know that. If there is, then we need to know. Wi-Fi. If you have open Wi-Fi to your, your customers, change your password. Make your customer ask for that Wi-Fi password. Jack in the Box loves to have free Wi-Fi. Well, what do you go? What do you see when you go to Jack in the Box in Riverside? Transients. Transients sitting outside. Transients sitting inside. Why is that? Free Wi-Fi. Plugs to plug their phones in. Don't allow that place to become a harder place for them to come. It's a safe space. The employees there are afraid to ask them to leave. They've been told by their managers not to ask them to leave because the managers themselves don't know what they're supposed to do. It all goes back to training your employees on what they are able to and what they can and cannot do. Again, everyone's heard that thing, you give a mouse a cookie, right? So if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. When you give him the milk, he'll probably ask for a straw. And when he's finished, he'll ask for a napkin. Then he'll want to look in the mirror and make sure he doesn't have a milk mustache. The more you give, the more someone will take. Again, that's just basic human nature. That goes to panhandling. If you have someone that's panhandling out front of your business or comes and asks you for your cans, don't give them to him. Don't give them to him. Because now he's going to expect you to do that on a regular basis. He's going to come next week. He's going to come the day you have an investor coming in and he's going to hang out. And your investor is going to say, whoa, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to invest in this property now. Those things, it's, it's a ripple effect. You never know. You might have a ten, some a future tenant coming in looking to rent from you and, and pay you X amount of dollars per month to have his business there. But when he sees a bunch of transients sitting around, yeah, that's not going to be good for my customers. I'm not going to be able to pay that guy the money he desires for his property. So again, it's your business. It's your property. It's your investment. Someone comes in to buy something, ask for ID. Nothing wrong with asking for ID, especially if they're going to pay with a credit card. Ask for that ID. Limit your return policy. I know Esteban can tell stories of, upon stories of people getting receipts from the trash, walking in and trying to return it. And that happens at a major retailer. Okay? Go digital. Go digital. And every now and then I'll go to a store. Like, Would you like your receipt emailed or printed? Email it to me. Well, what's your email address? I created my own email address just for receipts. Just for receipts. They send me spam mail, great, it goes to, it goes to that. But now I can go back and find that, that digital receipt. I hate having receipts in my wallet. I don't have any money in my wallet because I'm married, but I, you know, <laughs> I, you know, open up and there's receipts. <laughs> but, uh, you know, go digital. If you have that ability, go digital. It gives your, your customers that peace of mind. Hey, you know what? You want the email, that receipt email? We don't do any spam. We have a no spam policy, but it's a safer way that we can send you a receipt. It, it actually saves you some money. Now someone can't go and chop it up, come back and try to return it. Right? And that's what comes back to limit the return policy. Smaller retailers always hit the biggest. You might have a couple different people. You might have someone young working your cash register who doesn't know, who's afraid of that conflict, doesn't want to have that conflict. Again, yeah, you want to have them limit that policy. Um, it also gives it, if you are a business owner that does deals with credit card transaction, cash transaction, the digital receipt does not allow someone to take that information home. It's sent, it's gone. The only person might have access to it is through, you know, if it's Square, American Express, um, all the different retailers. The only person who would have access to that is maybe the owner or manager. And, uh, you know, again, transients find a way to steal the items and easy way to get money. So do not allow people to solicit in front of your business without your permission. Did anyone know that each year the Girl Scouts sign a contract with the businesses, like Stater Brothers, Albertsons? They actually, the, the council has to go to these businesses and ask for permission. Those Girl Scouts 
are basically guests. And a couple years back, they almost lost the Stater Brothers contract because of something that happened in San Bernardino in the Stater Brothers hometown. So again, even the Girl Scouts have to ask permission. So someone's out there soliciting, you know, ringing the bell for Salvation Army, you know, yeah, it's Christmas time, we want to give. You know what, if it's impacting your business, make them ask permission. I'm sorry, you can't be here. We have a no soliciting problem. Um, or, you know, order. We don't want you here. They refuse to leave, call us. We'll make them leave. We'll make them leave, plain and simple. These people need to respect your organization. They need to respect your establishment. Um, invest in security. Okay, they can do multiple stops per night. Usually they have routes. I'm not going to get into the, what the panels are going to say, but, and that's why we invited them here, so they can tell, tell you what they can do. But you know what? They're a second set of eyes. They're trained. I believe most of them go through um, uh, some sort of 832 class, which is arrest and control, where they have to be licensed by the Bureau of Security Services. So they, they, are, they are trained. They're not just some guy driving around in a car. Some of the companies are very innovative in what they're doing. But they are there. They're there in the middle of the night when you're asleep. My deputy's on a on a stolen car or riding catching up on paperwork. It's you know like Nicole said, we can't be everywhere all the time. I wish we could. In a perfect world, we would. In a perfect world, homelessness wouldn't exist. Everyone would be millionaires. Everyone would be you know the American. We'd all be living the American dream as it was told in the you know 1920s when everyone was coming to Ellis Island. It's not. We have to work. We have to work hard to do that and get to that point. Um, you know, with the security, maybe join a cooperative with some other, other companies in the area. Share the cost. Share the cost. You know, again, it's just ideas. Um, you know, again, I don't have all the answers. These are just some things that I've seen over the last 10 years. Um, you know, always open to new ideas, and I'm learning something new every day. But hopefully this it's giving you some ideas on, and some new thoughts on how you can protect your business. And I appreciate you guys, again, coming out today and taking the time to listen to us. And hopefully you guys will be able to take something away for it. Um, hope we have some time after the meeting. You can ask some questions to myself, Nicole, or the security companies. But uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, you can stay up here. Robert, you can stay up here. <laughs> I will uh, allow people to ask a couple of questions now, maybe while they're fresh in your mind. And while I'm doing that, um, while we're taking a couple of questions right now, I'll invite our uh, security companies to come up. We have three seats up here for the three individuals. I think we should have three here, um, at least two. <laughs> and, um, and then I'll give them some time to uh, introduce themselves. Um, did anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I'm next to Main Street Kitchen and Kitchen and Cap. Okay. So the homeless person was, um, went, I cut my tower in the back, then he went underneath my building, don't know how, cut my tower so he could charge his cell phone. I was without power for two weeks and I lost business. So then I get that all fixed. He's the person who's in charge of that deputy, 
and tell them, tell them your concerns. It becomes a training issue. If we don't know, we can't fix it. So, so my question is, because um, I support you guys, mm -hmm. I think you guys are amazing. However, if now I have Bob Wire, I have It does, it does. And now it's not fun as a woman going to the back of the door and have four men sleeping there. Exactly. And that's that's where we can do that now. With that and now we don't if we see someone we're driving back behind the alley and I see four people sleeping there, my deputy now can get out of his car because now I have a victim. You're the victim. I'm not calling you at two thirty morning to have you come down to Lake Elsinore from wherever it is that you Okay. But waking up at two thirty or three o'clock in the morning, come down and tell these four gentlemen Hey, I'm placing you under arrest for trespass. Okay. okay. Now, if I'm not the owner of the building, but the owner does not mind me doing this, do I just do I have to have the owner signature? No, you can have your you you have the best interest that in that building. All you have to do in that case is put the owner's name and number, because if there's something that happens in regards to you know, the reality of it, it's challenging for yes, the owner is well aware of it. Here's his phone number. She is legal standing in that building. And can make decisions. It's just like someone shoplifting out of your building. Okay. okay. Um, I have gotten those people trespassing here. Okay. Am I allowed to have to get into my tenants? You know, are they allowed to take the form that I've signed and be able to call the police? <coughs> Absolutely. That? Okay. Absolutely. So the question was just can you repeat the question? People can't hear you guys because you guys are using the mics. So he asked if his tenants have that form. Are they allowed to call the police? Yes, they are the person that has the vested interest in that property at the time. They have what's called legal standing. Those are the ones that are allowed to make that call. Even though they didn't sign, Even though they, didn't sign they are the person um, that has the vested interest that is in command and control of that building. Do they need to have a copy of that with them? No, we need to have a copy at our police station. What ends up happening is that letter then goes to our central dispatch so if someone calls and says i live at you know i'm at 350 main street or 350 railroad canyon i have a transient living in the back well when it gets dispatched to our deputy via our computer it'll actually say 602 letter on file they're good for one year so starting every month right now what i'm going through is going through and looking for all the ones that are expiring in may and sending them out again to the property owners or the tenants so that they can get them signed. Um, follow up. I've called the uh, police out there a couple of times. You know, I, I'll go up, I'll show the, the person that I'm objecting to, that I got this form. I'm asking you to leave. Would you please leave? If not, I'm going to call the police. I treat them with dignity first to try to get them out. And that usually works like 80% of the time. Okay. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to the police department and respond. Very professional. He just asked about the deputies coming out and not doing anything. Here's what's going on with that. There's been a complete shift in regards to dealing with the homeless. It takes paperwork. It takes time. There's a magic number in the court system that if a person misses court so many times, it has so many warrants that they will hold them until their arraignment. Well, you know what? We need to write those reports. We need to do those things because the transient, the homeless person isn't going to show up to court. Is it the right thing to do? At this time, yes. Again, we're offering help. I'm out once or twice a week with, with Social Work Action Group, and we're, we're offering help. And we're continually offering help to people. But at some point, you can lead that horse to water, but you can't make them drink. When they decline that help, then the enforcement comes in. It's an education versus enforcement right now. But my deputies at the Lake Elsinore Station, I should say my deputies, the deputies I work with at the Lake Elsinore Station, they know that they are to cite the person, okay? Offer the resources, especially, it's the serial people. It's the same people over and over and over again. They all have these cards. They all have my phone number. Some of them have figured out how to get my cell phone number. <laughs> That's why I carry two phones. <laughs> but we need to continue to treat them with dignity and respect because they are human beings. 
they are still a person, even though maybe they don't feel like it anymore. But like I said, there's, there has been a change, and it, it's, it's a squeaky wheel, and it's slow turning, but it is turning. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Supersede that, or should I have both? Or no. Uh, the extra patrol, uh, and just so we can clarify what the extra patrol request is, the extra patrol request is a form that you guys can fill out at the, at the police station, or go. On, um, I, I can send you one if you have an email. And basically, what you're telling us is, I need extra patrol in the area because I'm seeing an increase in transits, or I'm going to be on vacation, or I've got, you know, four buildings that are being renovated. And all that does is that allows us, it comes to me, it gets uh, distributed to the watch commanders, and they go over it with every deputy. Because each deputy works different hours, different shifts. We're not always here. We might be on vacation. That extra patrol request is just another tool to know, for us to be in the know of what's going on in the community. But it doesn't supersede anything. It works in conjunction with the trespass letter. We yes, would encourage both, yes. I would encourage both. Thank you, Kim. So we'll go ahead and jump into the panel. We will have questions after this, and there'll be an opportunity for us to ask some questions from the, the private security firms we have here today. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but that's okay. I told them each if they wouldn't mind coming up and sharing a couple of, or you can actually stay there, just share a couple of minutes about each of your businesses and um, some of the things that you've seen that have worked to address homelessness and maybe some innovative solutions that are currently um, offered by your company. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions. And as Kim mentioned, something that was really informative to me when we started talking about this was this idea of co-ops and the ability for several businesses, business property owners, centers to work together. So for example, you could have one private security firm for all of Main Street. Anyone that wants to sign in and help contribute, now that really spreads the cost across all of you. Um, and again, it goes back to being able to have eyes on your property at various times of the day. So I'll turn it over. We'll go ahead with MPS first. Michael, if you don't mind Thank getting you. started. Yeah, my pleasure. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Julian. I'm the president and CEO of uh, National Business Investigations and MPS Security and Protection. Our corporate headquarters is in Murrieta. Um, we, my father started the company in 1967, so for the last 51 years we've been in business, and um, I'm second generation, and when my son gets out of the Marine Corps and after college, uh, he intends to take over the business, so hopefully we'll be in the Valley for a very long time. Um, we do the security for the hospitals and the water districts in the Valley, so as you can imagine, we deal with the homeless situation on a daily basis. Um, we have taken a little bit different approach. I think we, we've partnered with uh, the County of Riverside Sheriff's Department and uh, Murrieta Police Department. I have close uh, personal friends that are kind of high up there. And so uh, we partnered with them. So when we go out, we don't just tell these guys they got to leave. We actually give them pamphlets and information and we connect them with uh, community services that can help them. Because, you know, we can shuffle these people from one location to another, but all, it, all it's doing is giving us job security. It's not helping you. It's, 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 we're just moving them around the, the chessboard. We try and do, and like they did, uh, I think, uh, she said, Nicole said they've taken four people off the streets. 
if we can help them help themselves and eliminate them as being homeless, then that, they're not going to just move around. They're going to be there. It's it's going to uh, eradicate the problem. That's not going to obviously work for everybody. But um, like uh, Robert said, they are human beings, and we've got to treat them as such. So uh, uh, this is something we do for the whole valley, and um, as I'm sure Omar will tell you, uh, it, we're, it's keeping us quite busy. Um, but there, th this is manageable, believe it or not. Uh, this can be um, taken care of. If we let it get out of control, it's going to be like Orange County because the more there are, the more power they will have. So this is something that needs to be addressed and handled um, very quickly. And we do do co-ops. You know, if you ha if you're in a strip mall, you can't afford five hundred dollars a month or even one hundred and fifty dollars for hits or whatever. The whatever the price is, you just break it up by as long as everyone agrees to, to buy in, you, you break it up by square footage and you just pay a percentage. So you're getting a service and uh, paying a fraction of the cost because everyone is splitting it up. Hi, I'm Omar with Chief Protective Services. We're based out of Corona uh, here in uh, Inland Empire. We have uh, several properties in Lake Elsinore. We have uh, properties in Los Angeles. We stem all the way from Orange County, Inland Empire, Palm Springs, and Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, the primary issue there with the high-rise buildings that we service there is trespassing. So trespassing for us is that we have a lot of experience in it. A lot of what he's uh, with, uh, he just mentioned with as far as making contact with, with the people who are trespassing, which in most cases are transients, it's not just trying to shoot them out of there. It's also trying to give them information. Because when you're... When you're approaching a subject like that, who's already in a position where they, they have nothing to lose, you're putting yourself at risk too when you're approaching them. So approach is everything and the way you're communicating is everything. And then having that, that, that communication and that, that kind of partnership with the local law enforcement in the area is tremendous. Um, I've noticed that most of the clients that we've had now, the, the biggest thing that helps them, which he kind of mentioned, you can, you can get together with your neighboring businesses and get one service together. But what really helps the most is communication amongst each other. A couple of the tips that uh, Deputy mentioned, which is landscaping, locking your dumpsters. It seems like it's a simple thing, and it's, it, it's some most cases is overlooked, but it's huge when you do those things first. And then going with the security company, it's, it, it, communication is huge. Biggest thing I've noticed that helps our clients is when they, they get like a, a standing guard service. A patrol service, which he shortly mentioned, is a limited service, but a standing guard service, which you can have a standing guard that's an actual patrol as well, that's designated to your area, that is tremendous. Because you have somebody, let's say eight hours, 12 hours of the day, who has, who has a radio, who has a, a phone for you to communicate with them, they're much more responsive than you would have like a patrol, a limited patrol service. Are there any questions? Thank you. For either one so of can, uh, <clears throat> I'll just start out with a question and I'll open yeah. it up. But I, what you described just a little bit, because I think you mentioned standing guard and patrol, mm -hmm. what does that look like? So if you're a business and you, what would the initial, you know, I guess needed service be yeah. if you were a full center, several centers on Riverside, what does that look like? And what do you, what does that, what does that provide the business? So with the patrol service, um, and by patrol, it's a limited service. You're paying for a hit, he, uh, he mentioned it too. A hit is a patrol stop. Patrol stop is 15 to 25 minutes. At least for our company, they might operate a little different. Patrol stop are limited, it's, it's very, it's, as far as costs, definitely cost effective, but it's not the same as, as having a standing guard on the entire time. The standing guard on the entire time is, is constantly visible, is constantly addressing things. The patrol service <coughs> drives in Patrols your property random times. You can choose how many patrol stops you can afford, but it's pretty limited. I have clients that use it. The clients that use it um, don't have a lot of issues with transients. They have, they're more of uh, residential communities. So that does, I don't know if any of you are residential communities. Sometimes it works for residential communities if your issues are noise disturbances, loitering, that kind of thing. But when you have an issue with trespassing, vandalism, theft on your property, the biggest way to combat that is having a standing guard on your property who's constantly responding. You could do a standing guard that's also a patrol. What that means is they're there for an entire eight hour shift or 12 hour shift, whatever you pay for, but they're in a patrol vehicle, which means that they can go from A to B if you have multiple locations yeah. that you need them to monitor. Oh, no Anything problem. To add, Michael? Uh, just to add to that, 
obviously budget is going to be a factor in everybody's decision in something like this. Um, if you have a lot of crime in general, then a standing guard is, uh, it's more expensive, but it, and it may be the way to go. In something like homeless, the homeless situation at night, they're gonna be bedding down there. They're gonna be there for six to eight hours. So to save money, it is feasible to do the patrols because they, if the patrol comes by in an hour or two hours or three hours time, they're gonna notice these people. They're gonna address it and hopefully take care of it. So. Uh, depending on your budget, obviously standing guard is always the best way to go because you've got somebody with your security interests uh, in mind full time for an 8, 10 or 12 hour shift. But I know that many clients, especially smaller businesses, get scared off by the price. You can still get uh, good security if we're talking about the homeless issue. You can still uh, address that for, uh, for a reasonable amount of money with the patrol hits. Okay, so some questions from the audience. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, up there. Let me bring the mic if you don't mind, just so we can make sure everybody hears. With uh, drive-by patrols, if if you were able to communicate with all the business owners in, let's say, Riverside Drive, from Riverside Drive to Four Corners and Stater Brothers, right in that one section there, and to have a patrolman on guard all day driving from one center to another center to another center and making those constant loops, and it wouldn't be an hour, it would probably be every half hour or something. Um, what kind of cost would we be looking at? Well, uh, it depends on how far, how many hits, and how many businesses we're talking about. But if you're splitting it, and, and keep in mind, guys, if you keep it, if you accidentally forget to lock a door, if they're if they're checking doors and so forth, it may not just be a homeless. It may be someone going door to door to try and break in. So there is more than just homeless that goes along with that. But uh, typically, twelve to eighteen dollars a hit. But if you you know if you're just if if somebody's uh, patrolling and they're doing several locations, it could be even less than that. So. Uh, it could cost you anywhere from $150 to you know three or $400 a month, and you've got really good coverage. And if you if you quantify that in the business that you might be losing, or the equipment, or the copper, or whatever that you might be losing, you're way ahead of the game with the prevention than you are actually paying for the damage or the or the loss afterwards. And you're talking total cost, right? Because then that's divided amongst the businesses. That would, no, that would be each, each probably okay. each business. Yeah, no, it's gonna, if to, I mean, to pay somebody, even minimum wage, which we don't do, but even to pay somebody hourly, you're gonna have to, it's gonna cost more than that. A cost per day per eight hour shift. Account manager, you know? <laughs> it's gonna be anywhere from $18 to $20 an hour. 18 to $20 an hour. So, you know, split that up. One sixty. For eight hours. Yeah, so split that up between 10 businesses. 16 bucks a day. And what is the patrol cost per hour? So again, that's standing guard. So the patrol hit can vary from, like Mike said, 12, between um, 12 to $20 per hour. But it's really just the amount of hits that they do. So it depends on how often and how many, but 12 to $20. And we can give you a, an armed guard for 26, 27 bucks an hour. And imagine what kind of security that's going to make you know, your people your employees for one thing, but your customers feel as well. If people are avoiding your business because they don't like to deal with the smell of urine on your doorstep or the people that look at them funny when they walk in, you're losing a lot of business. Did you have anything to add? As he was mentioning, it is a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of cost for security, especially if you go with the standing guard. But if you do look at it over time, like I have a, a client who has five McDonald locations. They spend a lot of money to get security. They have eight hours a day. They vary the times that the officer's there week to week so people don't know when the officer's schedule is, which helps quite a bit. But one thing they noticed, I had a meeting with them just last week, and one thing they noticed is their amount of sales went up by 20% over the last year. 
So that's because more people are willing to, more willing to come to their businesses now because they don't feel uncomfortable. They don't feel like there's a person there panhandling in front of their business or they don't feel that parking on their property, they might be susceptible to a break-in. So uh, it, could, it could help greatly. Great point, great point. Um, another question, Kim? Sorry, you have to use a mic. I'm getting yelled at. <laughs> okay, so if you have a standing guard, let's say we hired one for downtown Main Street and all the businesses went in because we have a lot of women that want to come down and shop and they don't feel very safe. We have a lot of us are hearing that. So my question is, what is your guard wearing? Do they look like a police officer? Do they look like they're undercover Joe Schmo? I mean, because I see some security cars and I used to be engaged to one who owned a business and it was just a, like a white car. So my question is, what does your business look like? Does it look like it's somebody who could protect well, us? Well, you've probably seen our vehicles on the road. We have, we do Eastern Municipal Water District and Elsinore uh, Municipal Water District, so our vehicles are, are all over the place. We have uh, newer RAV4s or um, Mo Rogue, Mazda, Rogues. They're like a small SUV, or we have pickup trucks. Um, they're, they have light bars on top. They have you know, the emblems and our PPO license number on the side and phone number and so forth. The officers, we have different uh, dresses for different clients. As we, we, a lot of our clients don't want the you know, military tactical look, and some love it. So we might have 5'11s in boots, and uh, you know, typically it's a blue, or sh a blue polo where we've got uh, a more officer-looking um, you know, uh, Dickies-type shirt. It kind of depends on what we agree on and what the cost is going to be. Yeah, the, we have the same options as far as uniform. Um, traditionally, depending on the type of issues, which, is, which it sounds like majority of the issues you're having is probably trespassing and just the overall un feeling unsafe. The biggest deterrent for uniform would be like a Class A. Our Class A is navy blue. It has our PPO patches with our company logo on the, on the uniform. They wear a gold badge, which says our company name, and it has their, their badge number on there. Um, very, very professional look. That helps quite a bit. Some people, some companies may feel that that may be too aggressive. Then we have what's like a polo uniform or a class B uniform. Uh, polo with, with uh, BDUs, which are uniform type, uh, our military style pants. And then it, obviously our PPO license will be showing on the uniform as well. Clearly identified as a security officer. And then the patrol vehicles that we have, our current fleet, our uh, Toyota Yaris's, which you've probably seen one parked outside, that was me driving in, clearly, clearly marked. Um, has our company number on there in the event that somebody sees something they need a report especially if it's something in your community they can call that number right away thank you are they armed and I think you mentioned there is that option right? you have the option of armed or unarmed obviously Additional if you go cost. armed yeah <laughs> obviously our armed is much more expensive right around the same rate that they were uh, he mentioned Fred from uh, code enforcement has a question yeah I, I can tell you uh, from my standpoint I take a lot of the complaints from residents that complain about the activities that pay, take place at a lot of these uh, shopping centers and, and strip malls, and you are losing business because a lot of these people will flat out tell me, I'm not going to shop in your city anymore. And so again, it's unfortunate. Um, we do what we can to, to address a lot of these issues, but you know it's a joint effort. But I do want to reiterate the fact that you, you are losing business because again, we take these phone calls every day. Um, just Thank to let you, you know. Fred. But I think that um, that was a good point that uh, that was brought up. We tried when we were thinking about who to invite today, make sure we had some really good security firms that have good reputations. And there are some out there that you may find um, that aren't really doing their job. We've heard um, of centers where the security guard's smoking a cigarette with the homeless guys. And that's obviously not what you're paying them to do, right? Um, or they park their car there and there's nobody actually there. They just park the car and pretend like they have security. Well, then the homeless people broke into the car to prove a point, like, we know you're not here. So you don't want that, right? And so you get what you pay for. And so I just want to elaborate a little bit. Um, what's some advice for folks in the room to make sure they're finding a good security firm? I think that the options are obviously important and the uniform and um, what are some questions or things they should look for to ensure that they're getting a legitimate um, security firm that's going to make a difference? 
Well, I would definitely say, excuse me, I would definitely say uh, go online and look at the reputations and the comments and the reviews uh, because there are a lot of companies out there that are, they, they pay minimum wage, they're all about the numbers. The more contracts they have uh, and the less they, they charge, the more they, they make it up on quantity rather than quality. And we, I, I always tell every potential client, I promise you I will not come in cheaper, the cheapest, because we're going to hire better people and keep them longer by paying them a little bit more. So that means I've got to charge a little bit more. But uh, go online and, and look at the reviews, believe me. Not not just what the customers and, and prior customers say, but what their employees say. Because if all their employees are going online saying it's the worst place in the world to work, you know it's probably not going to be a good uh, relationship with them if you hire them. I definitely agree with that. Um, Another thing you might want to look for when you're looking at a security company, obviously looking at the reviews, seeing what the, what the companies, uh, maybe even touching base with some of their current clients is great. But another thing is how is the company proving that they're able to, to provide you these services? Like patrol services are limited services, um, standing guard. How are they able to show you accountability? One thing within our company, I'm the quality control director for the company. In quality control, my number one thing is quality assurance. So making sure that I have the right shoe that fits at every location, but not only that, being able to show the client that they are getting, they're getting the service that they're paying for, but also how can they actually see that they're finding results. We have technology that we use, which is digital reporting, where you can view the reports at any moment at any time. Obviously, if you have a 24-hour service, that's greatly beneficial. If it's an eight-hour overnight service, that's still beneficial. You can go on at any time, view these reports. Not only that, you can actually GPS and see exactly where the officer is at every moment. There's options of doing detects where you can track the, the officer can, can, uh, can check certain locations. You can put a detects QR code on those areas. They can scan them. They can prove to you that they're actually showing the, that they're actually responding. Um, reporting is huge, and then obviously the communication with local law enforcement is humongous, that they're actually able to um, not only deter this activity, but how far are they going? Are they making sure these people aren't returning, and how are, how are they doing that? And if they're not doing these things, you should probably fire them, <laughs> right? A quality control department, you, that's the number one thing you want to see in, the co in, in a company. You, that's the number one question I would ask them. Do you have a quality control or a QA department? Do you have a team that's ensuring that the officers are trained correctly? And there are, are they checking on them on a daily basis? And how are they doing so? You absolutely would like to know that. Questions? If I can say so. I've had the pleasure of working with both these companies, um, Chief Protective Services, handles the Tuscany Hills area, uh, MPS handles the hospital. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted them here is because these are two firms that I feel, and the one I spoke about, that would best represent what we're trying to accomplish. Um, they're, they're class firms. I've never had an issue with an office from either one of them. Um, very willing to work with law enforcement and hit that uh, common goal that we're trying to do. Um, again, there are other firms out there. I've been called upon because there's suspicious activity and it ends up being, like I said, the security guard smoking with the transient or doing a drug deal or whatever the case may be, the nefarious activity. So I just want to add that that's the reason why they were asked uh, here. I can't recommend either one. I have to be unbiased, but I can say that I've never had an issue and that both of those firms, I think, would exemplify what we're trying to accomplish here in the city. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. More questions, anybody? OK, I have one more. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if, if you can just clarify what code enforcement's role is in all of this? Like, what do they do? I'll let you take that, Fred. What's code enforcement's role in all of this? What can you do? What is the city um, beyond, obviously, the police department? Again, it's, uh, you know, we work collectively with, uh, with really the community, law enforcement. Uh, we're generally the first line. Uh, we take a lot of the complaints in as far as transient activity, and we can go out and assess the situation and determine what course of action is, is, is necessary at that time. A lot of it is really just notifying property owners, especially the ones along Riverside Drive or the vacant lots, and, and just getting them involved. A lot of these property owners are just they're not in touch with what's going on. And so it's really our responsibility to say, hey, we have a problem out there and we need to address this uh, accordingly. And that's kind of the, the action that we're taking now. Um, some of these property owners are out of the state, out of the country. So again, it's really getting them involved to you know, 
maybe not necessarily hire a security company to go out and monitor, but just somebody to go out and take a look once a week, once every other week at their property so they know what's going on without us having to send official notices or um, you know, threaten abatement action against them, which is very costly. And I will say this, our code enforcement team does an excellent job with what they have. Again, we're a 43 square mile city. Code enforcement covers, I don't know, do you know how many municipal codes we have? <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds. So there's a variety of things that are being reported on a daily basis throughout our community that we have to go address. And we have how many code enforcement officers? Five altogether. Five altogether, 43 square miles. So what we do in Lake Elsinore is we're much more reactive we aren't just patrolling the city and writing down issues, right? Correct. And so we need you to report things. If your neighbor's not taking care of their property, there's graffiti on it, the fence is falling down, it looks run down, you need to report it. Now, everybody here thinks that the building um, where Better Party is looks like terrible, right? We all know that. We know there are some businesses that look really badly. There's a Circle K here that's vacant. We have to go through a long process to address that. It takes a long time, unfortunately, for us to force property owners. Sometimes we can't even find the property owner to address it. So there are going to be places that we can't just fix tomorrow. But again, it's very critical for you to report those things. But code enforcement is not a patrol. Code enforcement is not patrolling the city looking for these code issues. They need to be told to us so that we can make sure we respond. No, about 10 or 12 years ago, um, I allowed the police department to move into one of my shopping centers. Uh, Dr. Nelson and I gave them a free substation. And once that occurred, they started a volunteer senior citizens program, you know, where seniors come in and they man the desk during the days and were helping people and, you know, my point is, is that the city would not get them cars. If we had a senior citizen program, keep active, live, intelligent, older people doing things, they would take a lot of weight off of code enforcement for writing up things of people's houses going by. Why, aren't, why isn't somebody developing that? We are actually looking into that. I know Robert's been pricing out um, uniform costs. How much do we have any vehicles? How could we get vehicles? What does that look like? So that is one of the things we are looking at. They call it citizen, is it citizen action patrol or citizen patrol? I'm sorry. He brought up the uh, it, idea of uh, senior volunteers and I said we actually, Robert is working on looking at that and the cost and uh, vehicles and so. Sure. So just like anything, it's the logistics of getting that started. Uh, we do have a, a gentleman in the community that lives in Summerlee that was part of our Nor Norco uh, Senior Patrol, our community patrol. It's not just senior volunteers. It could be anybody in the community that has an interest in bettering their community. Um, things like this take time to get off the, off the ground. It takes money. It takes the Sheriff's Department working in conjunction with the city, who's gonna insure, who's gonna have the vehicles, who's gonna pay for the vehicles, who's gonna pay for the gas. So it's not a something that's gonna happen overnight. It's something that we started researching a few months ago. Um, we've moved it up to the next step where what's the cost of getting patches and what's the cost of getting uniforms? What's the cost of you know everything that goes on? The easy ups, the, the f printing of the flyers. So it's something. It, it's something that we'd like to get going. We do have the mounted posse um, that works out of Lake Elsinore Station. Um, you probably see them at Christmas time at the outlets and um, during uh, Winterfest, we'll have them out on the, on the streets with the horses. Um, that's one option we have right now. Um, but it's, we have our explorers, but the citizens patrol, the, the community patrol, um, is still something that's in the works. I wish I had a time frame, but I, I don't. But know that we do have other resources out there. Um, we're trying to get the Mountain Posse more involved so that if there's an accident, that we can have them come out as volunteers, shut down the road with a vehicle. They don't have to bring the horses, but just come out, you're authorized to drive a county vehicle, shut down the road, alleviate the deputies, let them go back to work. Um, so that's just something to, you know, where we are right now. So hopefully soon, by the end of the year, we'll have more, better answers or next month, but uh, that's, that's where that is at this point. Some question back there. We're just opening up this to any questions right now, just to make sure. 
This is probably a good question for Robert. We don't seem to have problems with the homeless, luckily, at our office, but we have problems with either they're on drugs or they're crazy. I don't know what their deal is, but we are constantly calling the police. They're constantly coming out, and they just ask them to leave, and the next day they're back. So just this morning, we've had the same man in front of our office screaming, yelling. He had a knife the other day. He had a stick today. And we, we're all women. Everybody's afraid to get out of their cars. Where are you at? Right next to the post office. Uh, the post office on? On the corner of Graham and Lindsay. Okay, okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure because yeah. there's a post office in Wilmore. I know we've invited oh, okay. people from no, Wilmore here as well. Um, well, again, that, that comes through the, the training issue on our end. That's something I have to address with my, my sergeant, my lieutenant, my captain um, on how to better deal with this. For the longest time, we've, again, we've always gone with let's just move them along, let's move them along. But we have to make it so that it's difficult. You've got to remember that homelessness is not a crime. Um, suffering from a mental illness is not a crime. Um, if we have someone that's walking around it as a danger, then obviously we'll take appropriate action. But I. Continue to call us. Do you have the 602 letter on file for that property? So that's number one. Number one. Well, continue number to call two us. is again, if you have patrol going through, then obviously that's deterring them. Look at all the other advice that Robert just gave. There's something that's attracting them to the center. They're out on the street. Yeah. yeah. They're in the library, they're on the corner. They're not protected within the corner. Our center, yeah. Well, remember this. The Supreme Court has ruled homelessness is not a crime. Okay. Uh, 2012, AB 5 was passed, given the Homeless Bill of Rights in the state of California. It allows them free passage as long as they do not interfere with people's ability to make a living. So we have to tread very carefully. But please, continue to call us. And don't be intimidated to call. I think some folks might be like, ah, this is an emergency. I'm not going to call. I don't have time. I'll do with it later. Um, there is a non-emergency line. <clears throat> Please continue to report it, report it, report it. Can I jump in on that too, Nicole? Yeah. By the way, um, if you have security that knows how to document this stuff, these guys can't, like you said, can't be everywhere all the time. If they're there and every time something like this happens and they continuously document it, and these guys do come out, though they were not there to witness any of it, and perhaps you did not know how to appropriately record this sort of thing so that they can have some teeth, we give our reports to them and now they know exactly what's occurred. Now they can finally do something. So, you know, accurate, accurately recording this sort of thing, documenting this sort of thing is very, very helpful. And also, I would say, that it makes me very nervous to hear that you've got an office full of women and crazy people wielding knives out front. And I teach active shooter survival all over the country. So uh, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but do you happen to have a weapon like a gun or something just in case one of these people? Okay. Um, it's, that's very unfortunate that you've got a situation where somebody could walk in and start actually doing you harm, not just causing a scene. This is okay. I was gonna say having a patrol um, company or a security company that's there, they can actually sign a private person for us on every time as well. Because it's at that point, you know, if we don't know about it, if, if you're not reporting it's not getting reported, then we can't fix it. It's just it, it, it's all the same as the squeaky wheel gets the wheel. Okay, keep calling. Keep calling, keep calling, keep calling. If you're not getting the results you want, again, I implore you guys to contact the watch commander. Okay? It's a training issue for us. It's an issue that we need to address. Um, if it's not, if it doesn't seem important to the officer, then, uh, but it's important to you, we want to know. And we'll tell you if a crime has been committed. We'll do what we can um, within the reality of the law. But we're, again, if we don't know about it, sergeant doesn't know about it, the corporal doesn't know about it, I don't have any stripes, I don't have any bars. I'm a, I'm a deputy just like everyone else. Now, I have no problem going to a deputy and saying, hey, man, you really messed up out there. These people expect us to do something. These people want us, are, are putting their trust in us. We have a public trust. And if we're not doing our job, they need to know. And like I said, I have no qualms talking to a full deputy aside and telling them that. I have no problem telling anybody that. But I can only do so much as a deputy. And that's where it has to be elevated. Sorry, and that's how things get changed. Another question over here. 
Um, you know, this, this isn't a question so much as I just wanted to pass something on, a good experience that I had um, with the officers. We had some uh, transients, this is at a shopping center, had some uh, transients that were showing up regularly, talked to the tenants, the tenants were telling us that, uh, it, you know, this is where it's happening. Uh, talked to the police, said this is what we have happening. They said, come down, file the 602. Went down, filed the 602. It took 10 minutes. Uh, they filed it in a, in a binder and said, hey, this is the binder. We keep everything. We let everybody know about it. Uh, and when your time comes up, we'll let you guys know. That's why we put the address on here so you can refill it again. Um, this was over the phone. They told me to come do that. At the time that I was on the phone, they also said, we're, we're going to transfer you now to an officer. The officer will you know, talk to you about your issue that's happening right in this moment, but you can do that later. So, or you can fill out the paper later. The officer called, uh, answered the phone and said, I'll be there shortly. We have an issue. I happened to be at the property at the time. Officer showed up within 10 minutes. Okay? He you know, asked somebody to you know, leave. What are you doing? He was nice. I didn't hear the conversation, but you know, it seemed to go okay. The guy moved on. Uh, the officer came over to me and said to me, hey, I know this area. I'm familiar with it. I haven't seen this homeless person here before. It's, you know, usually I know the people and I see them. I'm expecting this guy to show up here again. I will probably come by because, you know, if we keep going after him, I don't want him to think this is a comfortable place. The next day, I called the officer again because we had the same issue. Um, and he said, I'm just around the corner. I happened to be. He was there. My tenant told me within seconds of me calling, I think it was a coincidence, but it's just because that's their area. Then um, he went there. We had already had the form. He said, I heard you filled out the form. They had already let him know that the form had been filled out. Then he went and got rid of the person that was there and said, I wanted to, to let you know this was a different person. This wasn't the same guy. Um, so the things that I took from that are, one, you can fill out this form very quickly. Two, the police will work with you. If you give them a call, they very much said be the squeaky wheel. Landlords, the way to address it is put a range of addresses. It will cover your entire area rather than an individual tenant. If you're an individual tenant, you know, it sounds like you can do it either way. But the cooperation and the response from the 602 and how they're coming out regularly has been pretty good. And just the general knowledge of sharing with me what is happening and what they see and what they expect, I thought was very good. I haven't done it here, but I have done it in other areas where they meet with you and tell you, hey, cut this hedge, put a light here. That stuff is great and invaluable and things you just don't notice because you're at your property every day and it doesn't stick out to you. And it looks different at three in the morning than when you're there at three in the day. <laughs> Sorry for all the time. No, great points. Thank you for sharing. I had a gentleman back here, and then I'll come back up here. Good information, um, and 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 open my eyes on to a lot of things that I need to do around my my stores. Um, Want to get your thoughts around um, transients walking into my restaurants, uh, immediately going into the bathrooms. I've locked them up. They kind of hang out in the hallway until someone opens up the bathroom. They walk in. They spend a half an hour in there, defecate, not in the appropriate places, uh, take showers, etc. Come, they grab um, cups off of the street, come and use the uh, self-serve soda machines, and, and then you have to sanitize and everything that. And it's just a turn off to the customers. My cashier, you know, whoever I might have during the day, the night, whatever that happens, how do I have them address that? Because that's an immediate, they're walking in, they're moving right into the restroom or something. What, I'm sorry, what, what uh, business are you, sir? Uh, KFC Taco Bell and okay. KFC over on the Perfect. other side. Um, very simple. It's California. You have the right to refuse service to anyone. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. They're in my bathroom. We knock. You tell them to get out. We have the right to open it up. Negative. Okay. okay. There still is an ex what's called an expectation of privacy at that point. Okay. However, contact us, number one, so that we can come out there. We, at this point, if someone's in there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, my thought now is there's a medical aid. There's something going on in that, those regards that may require an immediate swift response from police and fire because there's something wrong. Did they overdose? Did they fall and slip, hit their head? Okay, they're not answering us. There's, showering. They're showering. They're, they're having a mental. <laughs> well, I understand that, but you gotta, you gotta go through my, my thinking, okay? At that point, yes, give me the key. We're gonna open and see what is going on, okay? They're trespassing. They're transient. We find them with a needle under their arm. Whatever the case may be, that's when we take the appropriate action. If they come in 
and they do that, call us. If it's the same transient that comes over and over and over again, which I'm going to assume it is, um, then, yep, the same few, then call us. And, that's, I, and, and again, I, I can't e empathize that enough. We need to know. We need to get those calls. We need to be told what is going on. Because there are those, and I'll, and I'll share this with you guys, for example, the 7-Eleven in Wildemar on Hidden Springs. Allowing transients to come in, feeding the transients, giving them drinks. I worked with Wildemar for many years. I know the owner of that 7-Eleven. I know his, his regional manager who kind of runs all the, three, all the stores that he owns. Made one phone call. Hey, this is what's happening. Check your cameras. Made a huge difference. Moved that employee out of that location. And, you know, whatever he did in regards to that, he did. But if we don't know, we're not, we're not being told what's happening. Uh, we can't make the change. Again, if, if that's going on, that's call. An it is an non-emergency <laughs> number. But if someone's in there for 40 minutes and you're not getting a response, you know, a 911 call is okay. Because at that point, maybe it is an overdose. Maybe it is a, a medical aid that we need. You know, it may not even be a, a criminal act. So, if they all get afraid though, if someone comes in, they sit down and they're not buying anything. Ask them to leave. You kick them out or you call the police. This is a PR issue that's going to come back and bite you. Well, I'm just going to go back really. We have three minutes, and I, I did have a made simple that's supposed to speak, and I know there's a lot of questions, and obviously all of us will be sticking around longer. Um, I'm just going to mention again, um, each of the things that we just shared today, as you start to make those changes and make them uncomfortable and make it less attractive for a variety of reasons, they're less likely going to choose you for the restroom because there's another business down the road that didn't do these things. I was down by in Orange County by the Santa Ana river areas and the mcdonald's there had taken um, triangle blocks and put it on all their walls so there's nowhere for them to sit comfortably i mean of course now some people would love to be able to have the sitting area but they know that that creates a hanging out area for these customers mm -hmm. um, and then i'll go back to patrol because i know um, stater brothers and some of these folks that do have patrol you don't want your 16 year old behind the cashier or 18 year old having to be the one to go up to and say you got to get out of here that's not comfortable for them but if you have yeah, exactly. And and some policy, some businesses say, hey, we don't want our employees talking to them. We t they tell them explicitly, just let them be. Well, that's where they can come in because you can call them directly and they can be there and they will help you. And it goes back to making them uncomfortable initially, making it known that this is not going to be your hangout spot. Um, you've got to work towards that initially and then then you can uh, hopefully avoid it in the future. But as they start to learn, they talk to each other. You know, they know, oh, yeah, you can go into KFC. They're not going to say anything to you. Take your cup and fill it up. Go into Jack in the Box. They've got Wi-Fi, and you can fill up your cup. Move your fountains behind the counter for a while if you have to. I go to some places. You've got to go up to the counter and get your cup refilled. What are some ways that you can try to prevent it? Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Jamie from Made Simple to come up really quick. And again, we'll all be here for questions. And if anyone wants to continue in this format, we can. If anyone needs to leave, um, please feel free to do so. And, and, and Jamie's been one of our partners here for the homeless issues and his company, Made Simple, um, in helping to hire the homeless um, and give them opportunity to, again, because if we don't help them at the same time, where are they going to go? What's going to happen? How's their life going to change? They need opportunity as well. So thank you, and I apologize for something. Oh, it's okay. Uh, thank you for having us, Nicole. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, yeah, we were we were called to come here, uh, maybe on a more positive note, um, that there are some homeless people that just need help. Uh, we are business owners. I own uh, Made Simple House and Commercial Cleaning. So, real quickly, I'll just share with you that we've had three success stories. Uh, hiring homeless, um, so they're, they're not all bad people. We do hire the ones that are looking for help. They go through some programs, they have to be trained, they have to be uh, background checked, they have to go through uh, a drug check. Um, but I can, I can share real quick that uh, all three of them have been wonderful. Um, they do a great job for us. And one of them has been reunited with her, her parents over in Hemet, and another one I was able to get her mother, his mother, out of homelessness in El Cajon, uh, San Diego area, 
and she's back here in Lake Elsinore, and they're both living a good and healthy life. So uh, let me let Jaime say something real quick. Uh, that's about it for me. We don't have much time. How much time do we have? Well, we represent the business sector. As you guys know, you know we have the, we have the government, we have the service sector, our, our heroes, law enforcement. So I just want to make an invitation. There's a lot that we can say. It's a lot we want to share. But there's a lot that we can do as business owners because we all want the same. What's in it for me? We want business. But at the same time, we love our city. We live in the city. We serve the city. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to leave the business owners that are here. Some of us, we're not on Main Street, but we live here. And Main Street is our marketplace. It's our showcase, you know, during Christmas, during events, you know, during holidays. So I'm just going to throw an invitation out there for all the business owners that are not on Main Street. We can have more flexibility than City Hall, than the police department, because we don't have to go through committees. We have our own decisions to make. We have our own money that we're going to invest into the city. So I would say if there's businesses like ours that we enjoy and we come to Main Street, Main Street shouldn't be the only ones to be paying for this. If we find a way that it's going to make the city better, it's going to make it more attractive, people are going to come. We show off the city. We, we brag about our city. So we don't just brag about Main Street. So there's going to be a lot of things that we can do, and this is just a, a micro suggestion, is that there's business out there, you know, like us. We're, this is not our address, per se, you know, our, our mailing address, but this is our city. And so if this one day is going to transform itself into a marvelous street that goes all the way down to the lake, as full of businesses that we're all, you know, we just want to make it full and people are going to want to come and feel comfortable, we should, be, we should participate. We believe that, you know, in the, in the saying that says, I'd rather have 2% of 1,000 people's effort than 100% of myself. So we don't have to ask for thousands of dollars in burning a uh, volunteer or, or just fatiguing uh, uh, donation fatigue from businesses. You know, there's a lot that can be done on 100 businesses giving $20 a month to add on to something like this. So I'm just throwing it out there. On the next meeting that we have, we have a lot of other ideas uh, of collective efforts. So we don't have time, but we're more than, you know, we're more than happy to uh, hang around. And in the next one, we'll talk. Thank you so much. And I'll make sure to email everybody after today's meeting, um, maybe tomorrow, with everybody's contact information, too, so in case you need to get it from today. Um, I'll just share, too, that uh, we don't know what is next, if we'll have another one of these meetings. I think it all depends on your feedback, so I welcome it. Um, you, again, we'll stick around and um, be here to share. I just want to thank Pins and Pockets for donating pizza. If you haven't gone there, it's really amazing. They have good food, too, lots of fun for the family. Um, so we appreciate that. And uh, again, thank you all for being here today. So I want to thank you for coming. Um, there are some things that were said today that's very concerning. And so I will address those issues with our city manager and our police chief and make sure because if people are doing what they did to your property, Kimberly, or waving knives outside your building, the Marine in me says they should be shot. <laughs> so, you know, so um, our city council, the five members of this city council have made public safety our priority. And so if we're not getting the safety that you deserve, then we need to do something different. That's the reality. And we're not saying our sheriff's department's not doing a good job. But uh, if there are some concerns out there, then we need to fix it. And the only way that we know about those concerns is if you tell us. All right? So I have some cards over there. It's got my cell phone number on it. You can call me. You can call one of the other council members. All of us are online with our emails. Contact any, either of, any of us, and I guarantee that you will get a response back, and we will, we will deal with those issues. So again, thank you for coming. We want you here in the city. We want to protect you just like we want to protect a private residence. We want to get the homeless that want help help, but those people breaking the law, we're not going to tolerate. That's the end state. So thank you. Have a great day. Good to meet you, Mark. You got a card? Yeah, I do. Of course. You know, uh,